be reading from John chapter 15, verse 1, to chapter 16, verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father... I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I've said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is doing service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. I remember the first time I showed Mary email. She had heard of it for a while, but she was amazed the first time she saw how easy it was. You know, just click send. There's no return address. There's no stamp. You don't have to take it in a, put it in an envelope and take it out to the mailbox. No, that's it, she said, when she first saw the first email sent. When you've only heard of something, never seen it before, just heard of it, you might be surprised when you first see it. You might be surprised what it looks like. Many people have heard of a family, but the family they've grown up in is so broken, they don't know what a real one is. No, a family is not where the father is always away. Even if he's around, he hardly pays any attention and probably drunk. And the mother is out looking for another man or is always high. And if she does speak to you, it's to scream or pretend that the problems don't exist. Uh, covering them up with sweet talk and flattery all the time. Discipline is either missing or abusive, and likely both. People raised in families like that don't know what a real family is and want to flee the one they have, flee to some relationship. The problem is they don't know what that is either, 
And so they'll get involved in sexual immorality at a young age, thinking that's what a relationship is. And if they're a girl, they'll be a prime target for an abuser. And then they'll perpetuate the cycle of dysfunctional families, absentee fathers, kids raising themselves in front of TVs. And if you tell them what you need is a healthy family and a stable relationship, they don't have any idea what that is. And they go, yeah, but they don't know what one looks like. I think in this area, there's a lot of people who think they know what the church looks like without any real idea of what it's supposed to look like. First, they think it's a building, and it certainly doesn't look like this, a gym. Then, as for the people, they probably won't even notice that most of them are segregated by race. It wouldn't occur to them that the church is not supposed to look like that. If they're traditional, they have strong ideas of what it's supposed to look like. Men, especially the preacher, they call him, should be always, in, of course, in a suit and tie. I came dressed right today, uh, reading from a 400-year-old translation, singing hymns, and everybody says, Amen, and they do some small talk after the service, and then they out the door. Uh, if they're more contemporary, they think it looks like a show. It's like a theater with lights and a band and a speaker wearing jeans and an untucked shirt talking about how cool Jesus is. Both will talk a lot about how many decisions they've created, and that's the one thing they agree on. The church is supposed to look like a respectable, winning machine. Whatever it looks like, they both agree, it looks good to the world. Then, of course, we have some people who drop out of church altogether, cynically criticizing all the churches for being part of big religion. Organized religion is always bad. Believing to the bottom of their heart that is totally unnecessary for following Jesus. That's what they're interested in, they say. Not all this mess and this politics and this uncomfortableness of other people and disappointments they get in the church. You know, sometimes those overly long, really boring sermons. And then comes the rubbing of elbows with those other church people. It's just Jesus and me, really all about me, but living together. They think it's what the Christian life looks like. Them by themselves at home. What does the Christian life look like? That's what Jesus describes here. In John chapter 15, it looks a lot different than many have thought. And we see that here in four parts. First, what constitutes the Christian life. Second, what is its root? Third, what is its fruit? And finally, its dispute. First, what constitutes the Christian life? What's it, what's it made of, in other words? Well, first he says, it's, it's a garden. It's constituted of life and growth and fruit. Now, remember, Jesus has apparently left the upper room of four at Gethsemane. Remember the upper room where the Lord's Supper was first instituted and now is on his way to Gethsemane. As he said at the end of chapter 14, where we read last week, he says, rise, let us go. And all that we have here in chapter 15 is apparently what the, he said while they're on their way, apparently while they're walking together, probably to Gethsemane. And if so, that's the case, uh, they may have passed in front of the temple where there was a large carving there above the gate of a grapevine. You know, carved into stone, hearkening back to the days when Moses sent a team, remember that, and to the promised land. And they came back with this vine uh, with a bunch of grapes so large, it took at least two men to carry it with a pole between them, you know, on their shoulders. Since then, Israel was often pictured in the Old Testament as God's, as God's vine or, or vineyard. And so it doesn't say that, but perhaps... They saw that carving as they walked together. You know, there's the carving, and Jesus says to them, I am the true vine. And so this now marks the seventh and the last of the seven I am statements Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. The final one, I am the true vine. In contrast to the false vines, the nation, the natural people who did not bear the fruit they were supposed to, in contrast to that, Jesus is he's the true vine bearing the good fruit, bearing the fruit, glorifying God, doing his works, loving his people to the end. So he's the true one. What constitutes the Christian life? Well, here's a picture of it. It's a garden in which Jesus himself is the vine. And he repeats that in verse 5. I am the true vine. And he adds to the picture, we are the fruit. Jesus is the vine, we're the fruit coming out of the vine, we're the branches, we're produced by his life, 
And so we're no more capable of producing our own life, our own fruit, than a bunch of, than, than a branch from a grapevine is capable of making grapes if you cut it off. What happens to a grapevine if you, if you cut it off from the vine, what, the branch? Well, it dies. And that's us if we're cut off. And then to add to the picture, the, the father is the vine dresser. He's the farmer in this vineyard. And he does two things. The vine dresser does two things. In verse 2, he cuts away the lifeless and he cultivates the living. Now, if a branch that appears to be a, attached to him, appears to be attached to him, in other words, claims to be a Christian, maybe the kind that goes to church. Or maybe he claims he doesn't need to go to church. He thinks he knows better already. He's just you know, full of his opinions. doesn't think he needs to go like those other poor people do. He, he's all right. It's just Jesus and him sitting home. Either way, says he or she is attached to Christ. Calls himself a believer. Professes been saved. But he or she bears no fruit. His or her life isn't any different from the people around him, from the culture around him. Just as materialistic, you know, just as much living for money, or just as racist, or just as sexually messed up as the average person around him. He doesn't support the mission of Christ to make more people attached to the true vine. And such a person is cut out. He's not bearing fruit. He's cut out. Something happens in his life. Maybe some offense provokes him. Like the music, it's like the music's too contemporary or it's too traditional. It's a per some perceived slight, didn't recognize me like I was, or they dress too shabbily, or they meet in a gym, or they dress too nicely and makes me uncomfortable. Whatever. Maybe the gospel finally annoys him or her too much, makes him convicted of their sins. Maybe he's drawn away to chase dollars instead of worship or pursue sexual immorality rather than to keep up this fiction of being a Christian. So... He drops out. Maybe he doesn't even claim to be a Christian anymore. Now that's sad. Just like it's sad to have a branch of a vine that doesn't bear fruit. It has to be cut out. But it's better to cut it off than pretend that it's still part of the vine. Pretend that it's, as people might say today, well, it's a, it's a carnal branch. That's why it's not bearing any fruit. It's a carnal branch. And maybe one day it will decide to make the vine Lord and then start to bear fruit. And until then, we should just let it stay attached. No, unfaithful branches are cut off. If a branch has no fruit, father lops it off. And then it's taken away, the branch is taken away and thrown in the fire in verse 6. So anyone who doesn't abide, means to remain in Christ, does it stay attached to him, gaining life from him, is, he says, thrown away and burned. Hints of hell. Now, the idea that everyone who professes to be a Christian, this is a common idea among, among people around us today, anyone who professes to be a Christian that is one, just because they say they are, that idea, and, and because, they're, because they say they're a Christian, um, they, they, don't, they don't deny the essential doctrines of the gospel, they're, they are one, and so they will be spared judgment no matter what kind of life they've lived, because that's so-called grace. That idea here is exposed as wrong in John chapter 15. If you are really saved by grace then you are attached to Jesus, the vine, who gives you life to produce good fruit. So we'll know that you're attached if you produce good fruit. What does the Christian life look like? It's fruitful. And if you do bear good fruit, that is in some ways your, your life now is more like Christ, becoming more so over time. You're more loving and you're more patient and kind. You're not perfect, but you're getting better. You have a passion for Christ. You're learning self-control. You aren't swept away into immorality. You're seeking first the kingdom of God, not dollars. You want to be used to see God's kingdom spread on earth however you can, whatever gift you have. You want it to be used for the kingdom of God to bear fruit. And you're doing that not because you have such good moral judgment. You're being disciplined and you're going to make yourself produce that fruit. No, Jesus says in verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Your fruitfulness is only because you are part of him. Your fruitfulness comes from him. And so if you do these things, you're bearing good fruit. That's a sign you are a part of him. The fruit doesn't make you part of him. The fruit comes from being a part of him. So if you do that, you're bearing fruit, you're attached, good, great, but you will be pruned. 
You won't be cut off, but you will be cut. That's what good gardeners do to their vines or their rose bushes or their crepe myrtles or whatever. They need to be pruned so they'll flourish even more in the future. Now, one difference, this analogy with plants, plants are pruned, so they'll be more fruitful in the future. Plants don't have a central nervous system. So pruning doesn't hurt them. They don't really care if you prune them. We do, and so we are. We are hurt. Pruning often is painful. Indeed, sometimes it is the pain itself that causes the new fruitfulness, that causes us to grow. Hardly ever do we become more fruitful because of the good times, of the easy successes. The money's flowing in, and that makes me more Christ-like. Probably not. The popularity grows. The pleasures you get. That's probably not going to help your fruitfulness. Most often it's because something is cut off from us. Something we were too attached to. A relationship we were depending on. The wealth we wanted too much. The success that puffed up our ego. So the father pruned us. Cut a little off here and there. After we got a little too wild. A little too attached to that thing. Whatever it was. He pruned us. Before the winter, so that come next spring, then we'll bear more fruit. That's what the Christian life looks like. Sometimes it looks like losing something dear to you, something you wanted so much, and you, it's cut off from you, and that hurts. And now you'll have to recover for a while through a long, hard, cold winter. But come spring, You'll bear good fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. With him, if we are a part of him, we can bear fruit. How do we get a part of him? How do we get life from Jesus? Well, he tells us in verse 3, already, in other words, if you will be pruned already. Speaking of these disciples, you are cleaned. The word they're cleaned or pruned. It's a variation of the same word is pruned. In verse 2, so he's, in English it doesn't appear to be the same, but in the original Greek it, it's a variation of the same word. Already you are pruned. Father's the vine dresser, he's pruning the branches. And already you have been pruned. He's telling them that they are clean or pruned because of the word that I have spoken to you. The word of God disciplines us and corrects us. It prunes us. Paul calls it the washing of water with the word. It cleanses us. And that's part of why we're here for to do. For you to hear the word, me to hear the word too, and us to be pruned, to be cleansed, to be washed by it. That's why we need to give it directly to you if it addresses your sins. Some people think the preacher should never mention things the people in the congregation might be doing. They may, may be sinning or might be struggling with. No, it's the exact opposite. You need to hear that word. So you're pruned, so you're trimmed, so you're washed. It's that washing of water. Here Jesus says that these disciples are clean or pruned because his words have pruned them. He's been speaking to them. So here's a picture of the Christian life. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The father is a careful gardener with his shears. We get our life, our ability to bear fruit from Jesus. But how? You now the word Jesus uses over and over again there, you probably notice it was abide or remain. You remain attached to Christ. Now, something that's is entirely passive. We just kind of sit back, you know, throw up our hands, tell God, you know, I'm abiding. Don't strive. Just abide. Some people's advice. But that's not the case here. Notice in verse 7, how we abide. Implication. If you abide in me, Jesus speaking, if you abide, you remain, you stay in me, and my words abide, they remain in you. So there's a Connection there. It's a reflection. One is just like the other. How we remain or dwell in him is how his word should remain in us, which is continually. It's not something we just kind of occasionally expose ourselves to. You know, like basting your turkey in butter. Just brush on. How often do you do it? Every hour, half hour, or something like that. You brush a little butter on so before it gets too dry, we read a verse or chapter every day. Listen to a sermon maybe once a week before we get too dry. I know it's more like boiling or deep frying. We stay absorbed in the word. 
reminding ourselves of it, saturating ourselves in it. We meditate on it, memorize it, sing it. Singing is a great way to keep yourself in, in the Word because this could be pleasant to do. Listen to it like you're doing right now. We live constantly in the Word like a fish abides in water. Fish, fishes abide in water. So we need to abide in His Word. Then notice also in verse 7, we ask God. That is, we pray. We immerse ourselves in the Word and we, we pray. That's how we abide. Remember Paul in Thessalonians? Pray continually. You're just breathing out prayer all day long. And if we do that, we, ask, we can then ask for whatever we wish. Does that mean now finally we can ask for that Cadillac I've always wanted? Yeah. That wealth, that newest gadget that Apple's come out with, that stuff that we've always wanted? Hmm. Now, do you think after you've saturated yourself, you've abided in His Word, and His Word tells you to seek first the kingdom of God, to beware of all kinds of greed, to set your affection on things above, you've abided in all that, you've saturated in all that, then after that you'll still want first and foremost that Cadillac, the big bucks, the newest gadget from Apple? No, of course not. If you have the word abide in you, what you want is transformed. Ask for whatever you want. Now what you want is different because you've been abiding in Him. You want God's glory. You want His kingdom to come in your life. So we wish above all to abide in Jesus. And so that's what you pray for, for more of Jesus in your life. And that's what you'll get. Now, sometimes it may take some time, but it will be done for you. So what does the Christian life look like? Second, it's root. Where does his life come from? In other words, what anchors it? What's, is it duty? Is that it? We've got to be religious people. We've got to keep our, keep our obligations. Do our duty. We're God's slaves, and so we have to do what he says. So it's about obligations and, and rule-keeping and grimly making ourselves do some things we really don't want to do, like go to that boring church in the gym. Is that what is the root? Well, it has three... The Christian life, our life, has three interwoven, intermingled, inseparable roots from verses 8 to 11. They are glory, love, and joy. Those are the roots. By this, in verse 8, is my Father glorified. A root of our Christian lives is that we yearn to glorify God. That is, we want to show Him to be valuable to be the weightiest thing in life. Original Hebrew, now Old Testament's written in Greek, but the Hebrew, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the word in the Old Testament for glory was kabod, means, literally means heavy. So the angels were saying when Isaiah saw the Lord in the temple, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory, his heaviness. So to glorify is to show something is weighty, is heavy, is the heaviest, the weightiest, the most important thing in your life, in, in the universe. And people show that by the, the time, the attention, the money they give to something. What is weighty? What's really important? What's life about? And we glorify God by showing that He is that one. So we have come to church so we can be seen as the big man, as the weighty one, throw our weight around, but so that Jesus would be. We want His Word, His kingdom to triumph. We want other people to want God more than they want cash or relationships or, or thrills. We want them to show that God is the weightiest thing in their life. By wanting that, we glorify God. We show Him to be weighty. It's a root of the Christian life. The root of the Christian life is, is love. We're all kind of in, intermingled here. The true Christian loves God. That's why he or she wants to glorify God. He or she loves God because God has loved him or her first. We love God because he's loved us first. Here in verse 9, Jesus says that he loved us as, that is in the same way, the Father has loved me. Think of that statement in verse 9. 
I've loved you as, in the same way, the Father has loved me. That's astounding. It means that the same love, it's that amazing love we sang about, the same love that the Father eternally had for the Son from before the universe was created, the Son who was perfect, who had nothing about Him not to love, who was God Himself, who was perfectly fit for love, the same love that the Father had for the Son, that same love He had for us. The Son has for us. Jesus has for us. For us. We who are not eternal, who were created at a certain time, we who are not perfect, we ought to have a lot about us not to love, who are unfit for love. Yet still, the Son has that same eternal love the Father had for him, for us. He graciously decided to love us anyway and loved us in the same way that the Father loved him. Then there's another abide. First is abide in him, abide in his word. And then here, Jesus says, abide, that is remain in my love. That is bask in it. Like you, like you may lay out of the sun on a warm spring day. Sing about it like we've already done. Let it immerse you. Let it saturate your life. That the Son has loved you in the same way that the Father loved the Son from eternity past. Notice verse 10. But, and we do that, we show that we enjoy His love by keeping His commandments. And again, this strikes us as just weird today when we're told that love and commands are incompatible. You know, if you, if you love, you don't give commands. And if you're really loving, you don't have to follow laws and commands. Well, they're not. That's not true. If you love God because He first loved you, you will keep his commands. And by doing that, you stay in the Father's love. By keeping his commands, you abide in his love. Love is a root of the Christian life. So is joy. It's not driven, the Christian life is not driven by grim duties. You just gotta make yourself do because you fear the consequences if you don't. You're threatened with hell or whatever. You do it for the joy you have in it because you enjoy it Notice verse 11. This is the night Jesus was betrayed. Remember the context of all this. This is the night Jesus was betrayed. He's already sent Judas on his way. What you do, go and do quickly. He knows the wheels of the conspiracy against him are already in motion. That this, these soldiers are already getting together, about to go and capture him. And that will lead to his crucifixion. He knows he's facing betrayal and a horrendous experience of, of beatings and crucifixion. Yet... Still, he says all this. Now, he's troubled by it all. Remember, he already said, my soul is deeply troubled. While he tells us, don't let our hearts be troubled. He's about to sweat so much, it flows like blood. As he prays, Father, if it be your will, because this is so horrendous, what he's about to go through, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Hebrew says he despised the shame, the shame of the cross, he despised it, but he went through it in Hebrews chapter 12 for the joy set before him. There's joy at the end of this, and it overcomes the shame he despised. Here that joy came from giving us joy. Notice verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, all that we heard so far. By glorifying the Father, showing He's the weightiest thing in your life, abiding in love by keeping His commandments. He says He said these things that, that is the purpose, by saying these things, the purpose is that my joy, joy so great it overcomes the despising of the shame of the crucifixion, that joy may be in you. He is, even right now. As he's saying this, he's walking to the place of his betrayal. And what does he want? What is he talking about? What is he after? For us to share his joy. Our joy was on his mind that night. He wants us to have his joy. And may our joy, he says at the end of verse 11, may it be Full. 
You look at your life, and sure, you were, you were pruned from time to time. You were cut. You weren't cut off, but you were cut. But you're overwhelmed that you had so much good. What joy. Those are the roots of the Christian life. Glory, love, and joy. The third, the third way, the thing, thing that it looks like, what constitutes the Christian life, is, is fruit. We had to bear much fruit, in verse 8, to prove we are disciples. Now, what is it? What, what, what fruit is it? Starting in verse 12, love. Love for God is a root. Love for each other, each other is a fruit. And he gives us, again, the command to, to love each other. Love one another. To do it as, in other words, in the same way, I have loved you. Sacrificially, willing to lay our, down our lives for our friends. There's no great exam, greater example of love than to give your life for someone. It's the soldier who falls in a grenade so his friends can live. But more commonly, it's the wife and the mother who gives up her career to raise children. It's the father who sacrifices some advancement to be with the family more, who gives up making a little more money so he can be involved in church. It's the friend who gives, sacrificing expensive vacations so his or her friends in church can have what they need. That's love. Here Jesus is now laying down his life for his friends. And he calls us friends in verse 15. If we do what he commands, we're his friends. If we don't, well, then we're not. We're not just slaves who do what we're told. We're his friends. We're working with him to bear much fruit. He's, he, we know about his mission. He's given it to us. He's described it for us. We're his partners in it. Now, we're minor partners, but we're his partners. Again, the root is his prior love for us. We love because he first loved us. Here, we did not choose him. At least not first, anyway. Our choice for him, we did choose him, but our choice for him is not the cause of his choice for us. It's the other way around. If we think that we're now his friends because we made the right decision, you know, we were kind of estranged, and then we made the right decision, we made the decision to, to be reconciled, and so we were. It all depended on us. No, then we don't realize that his decision came first. He decided, this one's going to be my friend. And he befriended us. And then we change, we keep his commands, we bear fruit because of his decision. His decision causes ours. He first chose to befriend and to call us. When we heard that call, then our chains fell off. Our heart was free. We rose, went forth, and followed thee. Now he did that, he chose us first to appoint us to, to go and bear fruit. Here, one fruit is to go. Go and bear fruit. Go find other people to abide in Christ. Go on a mission. Go to Yanceyville or North Hills Apartments. Go to friends. Go to your own children, maybe. Get your children to hear the gospel. Call other people to love him, to keep his commandments, to bear fruit too. And this fruit, this fruit that these people that we go to should abide. That is, they remain believers. Not just some confession they made and then they don't come, they, they don't abide anymore. They don't stay anymore. They don't come to church anymore. They went down the aisle once, they said a prayer, and then you don't see them anymore again. He made a confession, they got baptized maybe, and then they disappear. No, that's not, that's not the kind of fruit. They abide, they remain. And they bear fruit. And you bear this fruit in order that, that's the purpose of verse 16, the reason of going and bearing fruit that lasts, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that is for his sake, for his glory, because we love him, to fulfill his mission, he will give it to us. Jesus wants us asking the Father and getting what we ask. To do that, we first have to bear much fruit. We bear much fruit, we go make disciples, and we pray for that disciples, and we and he, we ask for more disciples, we ask for more fruit, and we get it. He told us that already in the beginning. He repeats it again in verse 17. We bear the fruit of 
loving one another. Now, does the one who drops out of church because they're, they say whatever excuse, there are too many hypocrites because of church politics or they got their feelings hurt. They get, they, their, their ego was bruised because they didn't get the recognition they thought they deserved or, or they just want to make a little more money. And so they work on Sunday mornings instead of worship. Does he or she love one another? Is such a person keeping the command to love one another? Is he or she loving other believers by refusing to spend time with them, giving to them, taking their fair share of the ministry? No, of course not. Christian life doesn't look like sitting at home on the couch watching your favorite preacher on the Internet, detached from the church. The only kind of people who are detached are those who aren't abiding, who have been cut off. What's the Christian life look like? Just one more piece of the picture to see what the Christian life really looks like. And it's not all sweetness and harmony, you know, the church in the wildwood, nestled peacefully with nature, by gently flowing streams, a happy home for everyone, kind of at peace with the world. No, there's a dispute. The Christian life is at war with the world. Now, recently, Jesus is being sold on TV, including at the Super Bowl, as he gets us. You know, he's accepting, Jesus is accepting like us. And, of course, that ad is hoping to get people to like Jesus and us. Still, despite all that, trying to be so winsome and charming. Still, a congresswoman said that the ads are, are trying to, quote, make fascism look benign. Yeah, an ad about Jesus is about fascism, you know, whatever. They still reject Jesus, no matter how, how much you try to charm them. Now, today, many assume that if you're like Jesus, you should be liked by everyone. You should have popularity, you should win friends and influence people. And that's a sign, they think, you know, that you're doing something right. You're getting the crowds, you're getting the people to like you. But starting in verse 18, Jesus teaches the opposite. What does the Christian life look like? Fourth, it looks like a dispute, like a war. The world will hate you, and that's okay. He says in verse 18, it will hate you because... It hated me first. This is one of the last things Jesus teaches his disciples. Don't be surprised when the world hates you. It hated me too. It's weird today. The way we claim to follow a crucified, rejected Lord. And yet we're shocked when we're not loved and accepted. When we're not popular. When they call us fascist. In fact, if we are widely loved... That's a sign of a problem. In verse 20, if you were of the world, or you came, if you came from the world, the world would love you as its own. You would be accepted. So it's precisely because we are chosen out of the world that the world hates us because they're not chosen by him. Now today it will call us bigots and haters and fascists because we won't go along with their sin. It doesn't matter how nicely we try to put it. They still hate us for the truth. Doesn't matter how nicely you put the truth. As long as you're saying the truth, they're going to hate you for it. That's what they did to Jesus himself. Remember, he told us already that we're not greater than our master. And so we can expect the same rejection that Jesus got. There will be some who believe, who don't reject us. That will be good fruit that will bear. Who keep the word of God. They will abide in him. They'll, they'll be a part of us. But the world as a whole generally, will reject us, just as they rejected Jesus. Now, they won't say that. In this culture, they'll say that it's because we're not like Jesus. That's the reason they hate us. Of course, they have a fictional Jesus in their minds, the one they, they made up to suit themselves, the one who gets us, the idol of Jesus they created in their imaginations, who approves of their sins, who never rebukes them, who doesn't prune them, who doesn't cut anybody off, whose commands they don't have to obey. They think they're going to just flout his commands and live as they want. And uh, they'll be accepted still in the end, they think. Who tells them that they're saved because they prayed a prayer sometime back that they were manipulated into as a kid and, and it left them unchanged and fruitless. That's the Jesus they want. And if we don't give them that one, they'll say something's wrong with us. That we're a cult. We're legalistic. We're fascist. But the truth is that they reject us on account of 
in verse 21, that it's because of his name, because we're associated with Jesus, because they don't know the Father and they don't know Jesus. They know what they want. They want their sins. They want a sense of assurance that they're okay in their sins without repenting. They want a religion. But they don't want God. Jesus came, God in human flesh, gave them the word of God, gave them the truth, told them the truth will set you free. And they show what humanity will do to God if they can get their hands on him. Jesus has shown the world its sin. And they hate him for it. So they hate God. And God then fulfills his word by exposing them. Like the Pharisees who could not believe back in chapter 12. And so they they fulfilled God's word by not believing. And Judas who betrayed him in chapter 13 who fulfilled God's word by betraying him. Now the world hates him without cause because scripture must be fulfilled. They keep God's word. Verse 25. By doing what they, they do bearing bad fruit. But that puts us in a horrible position. You think about it. He told us to go, bear fruit, find people who want to be attached to him. We're told to go. We're supposed to bear the fruit of bringing others to love him. But they naturally hate him. Imagine trying to sell Chinese food to people who hate Chinese food. It's kind of hard to do. Well, that's part of what it looks like being a Christian, trying to win a hostile world. But we have a helper in verse 26. Again, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit. And he's done that already, of course, for us. So we have now already, we have this Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of truth who's out there testifying for us. Who's out there changing hearts. You know, hearts that right now maybe they hate him. They hate God. They may not admit it, but they really do. And the Holy Spirit can change their hearts. Soften their hearts. Give them a new heart. Take out the heart of stone. Give them a heart of flesh that now loves him. So when we hear the Spirit testifying to us, we can believe and keep his word. When they hear the Spirit testifying to them, he softens their hearts. He prepares them. And now we can bear fruit because he's at work. The helper. We need the helper. He won't do that for everyone, though. He doesn't soften every heart. We'll still get some rejection. We'll still be called fascist. The believers in the early church were expelled from the synagogues, like Jesus said they would be here. Some were killed, like Jesus said they would be here. He notified them ahead of time. And their killers, like Paul, watching the cloaks of those who were stoning Stephen, thought that they were serving God, thought it was a good work. Today we might be ostracized, forbidden to share on campus, labeled haters, not hired, not published, banned. Jesus warned us that it would happen in chapter 16, verse 1. So when it does... We're not discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Don't fall away. You know, you got rejected. Don't give up evangelism. If you're not a great success. No, don't do that. He's told you what it would look like. It looks like coming against hostility, opposition, a dispute with the world. It doesn't know the Father or Jesus. That's what it looks like. To live the Christian life. So there's the picture. It's a garden and you're a branch attached to the vine, attached to Jesus from which you get your life. The father's the gardener. He's pruning you some, cleansing you, challenging you, cutting you with his word. Are you remaining in it? Well, if so, we'll see in your life. The fruit is love. You love the other people. Did Jesus love just like he was loved by the Father? You love the church. Now, sure, you, do, you have to endure sometimes hatred, and rejection, insults. Jesus did. But it's a small price to pay compared to the price that was paid for you. The hatred of the world is a small taste of bitterness compared to the great sweetness of the love of God that you now feast on. So your question is not... You know, why is this happening to me? This this pruning or this persecution. Why is this happening to me? No. When you taste again the glory and the love and the joy that Jesus gives you, your question then is, how can it be that you, my God, should die for me? 
That's what the Christian life looks like. Is that what your life looks like?